while people are still logging on, um, I want to uh, give a few announcements. So first of all, today's uh, seminar is going to be one in our top 10, uh, the, the top 10 unanswered questions of MPMI um, series. So we have, in case you're just getting involved with this, this is an initiative of the MPMI editorial board. It's a quest to find the big unanswered questions in our field and to, we crowdsourced the effort to find the top 10. That was really exciting. That happened uh, almost a couple of years ago now. And since then, we've been building on this. Question one is the top question. Almost half of the people responding chose this question as their top question. And so obviously it's one I'm personally also very excited about because it connects to some of the things that the um, questions that I wonder about. Um, so question number one is how do plants simultaneously engage with beneficial and pathogenic microbes? How do they do this? How do you turn down your defenses to let beneficial uh, symbionts in and then up them to keep the pathogens out? It's a, it's a very tricky and complicated question. And now that we're thinking a lot about the microbiome is one that we are really thinking of. Um, so. Uh, I, I pondered a long time about who I was going to invite to give this seminar, to give the, write this review. Um, and then of course the, the seminar is on this review and uh, Ashley is going to be typing into the chat uh, the link about the top 10 questions, but also the link of where to find this, the paper uh, that is the basis for this seminar. So anyway, I pondered long and hard and I realized that we really needed a fresh perspective, that this is a big question that's that's been growing and it should have been around for ages, but the fact is it hasn't. We've only just started thinking about this weird dichotomy um, in this sort of you know, two-faced relationship that plants have with microbes fairly recently. And I realized we needed to have a really forward-looking perspective. And so after that, I, I invited Kara Haney, who is a real um, a researcher who is, as, so an up and coming researcher who has added a lot of good big ideas to the way we think about this. She's a professor at the University of British Columbia. And, and uh, with us today is her co-author, David Toms, who is a postdoc at the University of British Columbia in her lab. And the third author was Yan Liang, uh, a researcher from Zhejiang University, um, who was not going to be here for the seminar, but who did participate in writing the review, um, who also pulls together a real interest in both um, playing both sides of this interaction. How do plants interact with, with beneficials and pathogens? Anyway, question one, so central, big, um, I'm really super excited with how the review turned out. I hope you are too. Um, it's already getting a lot of a lot of looks. Um, it's going to be coming out this month in May to anchor our focus issue on the same topic, and we've got a lot of exciting papers there. So um, I hope you take a look. Um, and this reminds me that our next focus issue submissions are still being accepted, and that's on question two, which is how does the abiotic environment influence plant microbe interactions? And the answer is a lot differently. And so there are many, many different ways you could look at this. And I'm really excited about the papers that are starting to come in or the inquiries. So let me know if you have any questions. Okay, um, one other uh, little update is, oh, our next virtual seminar will be June 1st. So put that on your calendar. It's going to be by Sarah Pottinger, who is the winner of our first MPMI Top Grad Student Award paper, terrific paper she wrote in 2020. Really excited to hear her come talk about her research in Roger Innes's lab. And, um, and then we're gonna be taking a break in July for the first of ISMPMI's e-symposia. There are gonna be three spaced across um, the second half of this year. And each one will, will be over the course of two days, two half days. Um, and in fact, Kara Haney is going to be the, is the organizer and host of the third e-symposium, which addresses a lot of the ideas she's talking about today. Finally, 
we are trying out, we're, we're trying to make this more inclusive and we are turning on live transcript for the first time. So this is a bit of a learning experience for us. And what we are planning to do is to have this posted along with the seminar, um, which will be recorded and which um, should be up later today or tomorrow morning, depending on where you are. And, um, and what I would like to ask for is for people in the audience, if you are interested in helping us to improve um, inclusion um, for these seminars, would you like to offer to help edit the transcript? The automatic transcription is pretty good. We've tested it out, but it's not infallible. And it sometimes struggles um, with unfamiliar words or names. And there are gonna be a lot of unfamiliar words <clears throat> for that particular dictionary today. So if you would like to volunteer to help edit the transcript, I think that I anticipate this won't be more than a couple hours of work, but it's the first time we're doing it. So please let us know. Really excited about this and hope that we'll be doing a lot more of this going forward. Okay, sorry about how long all of those took, but I think we now have um, a lot of the people um, on a lot of participants online. So we're, we're getting ready for that. So I'm going to turn it over now to, oh, I should say, um, co-hosting with me today is Raka Mitra, who is a professor at Carleton in Minnesota. And she is also our uh, the host and producer of our podcast, Microgreens. And get ready for some new episodes coming out in May. I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this over to Kara Haney now. And please remember, if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A. You can type them in at any time, and then we will read off your questions um, after the seminar. Okay, thank you. Kara, on to you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Jean, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I'm uh, beyond excited to have had the opportunity to write this review um, and to talk to you all today about, um, about this question, which is personally one of my favorite questions in our field as well. Um, so I wanted to start with this figure that was from uh, this wonderful overview piece uh, written by Jean Harris and other members of uh, the MPMI uh, editorial board and community. Um, showing the landscape of the top 10 unanswered questions in our field. So the past 25 to 30 years in our field has really been a golden era where we've understood receptors and pathways uh, in plant microbe interactions and so much else about plant and microbial biology. Uh, what I love about this uh, review or and uh, about the top 10 topics is how much intersectionality there is between them. And so how do we take things that we know about signaling pathways that regulate abiotic stress and integrate those with immunity? How do we take all of what we know about plant microbe interactions and integrate that with ecology? Um, and of course, our uh, question that we're gonna uh, hopefully provide some insights into today uh, is interactions between beneficial and pathogenic microbes, but actually brings in so many of these other questions as well. Um, and so the question that we were tasked with providing insights to is how do plants engage with beneficial microorganisms while at the same time restricting pathogens? And for me, that immediately calls on uh, what I call the continuum of symbiosis. Um, and I'm going to use symbiosis in its literal sense, which means living together, and includes pathogens, commensals, and mutualists. Uh, and so pathogens live with plants, although they cause harm and disease, as do uh, mutualists and commensals. Um, and so the reason, or one of the reasons that this question is so interesting to me is when we think about how can a plant fight off pathogens, with, um, we also have to think how it can do that without killing off the microbiome um, and other uh, potentially mutualistic symbioses. And similarly, when plants engage in symbiosis, how can they do this without leaving themselves vulnerable to pathogens? And so I'm going to come back to these questions, um, but first I would like to introduce uh, my co-authors uh, in a little bit more detail. And so I'm joined today uh, with by Dr. David Toms. Um, Dr. David Toms did his PhD at uh, Indiana University with Sid Shaw, uh, working on cell biology of microtubule formation. Um, and I actually really like that David comes from uh, not a plant microbe interaction background, but a cell biology background. And so I think brings some really new insights and perspectives. Um, and he's currently a postdoc at my lab. 
David's interests are literally this question. I think I could probably like paraphrase this question from the email that he wrote me about uh, uh, potentially joining my lab. Uh, and so when I was thinking about who could co-write this review with me, David was really an obvious choice and I think has brought some really new and exciting ideas. Um, we also co-wrote this review with uh, Yan Liang. Uh, Yan did her PhD with Jean Harris at the University of Vermont studying rhizobia legume symbioses. And from there, she did her postdoc at the University of Missouri with Gary Stacy. Um, and she's currently an assistant professor at Zhejiang University in China, uh, which is a very prestigious university for those of you that don't know it. Um, and Yan has done really exciting work on how plants can recognize signaling molecules from microbes and decide whether they're friends or foes. So how can plants tell the difference between chitin or lipocytooligosaccharides and then tell whether it's a mutualist or a pathogen? Um, and these are just a few of the really exciting works. Um, the bottom one is from her, uh, her postdoc work with Gary Stacy. And then she's continu uh, continued in a similar vein of understanding how these signaling molecules tell plants uh, about mutualists or pathogens. And I really encourage you to read her contributions in the review. Okay, and so I'm gonna start um, uh, by telling you a little bit about where I came from in our field. Um, and that hopefully will lead you to uh, how I think about this question. Um, so I actually have been in the molecular plant microbe interaction field for a very long time. Um, I was an undergraduate plant science major. Uh, I didn't really know about research at the time. I really liked to like garden and hike, and I don't think I'd really thought it through, but I think I thought that I could turn a career in uh, plant science into a career in hiking or just like being in the forest. I don't think I'd really thought about it. Um, but when I was an undergraduate, a first year student, my academic advisor suggested I take a class called plant pathology um, that was taught by Bill Fry. Um, so the first day of this class, uh, it was, this is the late 90s, and it was just a few years after the first plant disease resistance genes had been cloned. So the first class, my classmates were talking about things like our genes and gene for gene resistance and NLRs and hypersensitive response, and I had no idea what they were talking about. And so I went up to Dr. Fry after class and I said, you know, my advisor suggested I take this class, but I really don't think I should be here. Um, I don't understand what's going on. So he pulls out his roster on paper in those days um, and said, okay, what's your name? Um, and I said, my name's Kara Haney. And he said, you should absolutely be here. You're only here in fact, because of a plant pathogen. And at the time I had no idea what he was talking about, although I'm sure many of you do. Um, it turns out Dr. Fry worked on late blight uh, caused by Phytophthora infestans, which caused um, one of the most notorious uh, uh, famines in European history. Uh, and that's the Irish potato famine. Um, and so uh, most of you need no introduction to this, but this happened in the late 1800s and resulted in about a quarter of the population of Ireland, um, my dad's family included, uh, fleeing and immigrating uh, to other countries. Um, and so it turns out that my family history and a history of immigration in my family uh, was shaped by plant microbe interactions. So Dr. Fry did convince me to stay in the class um, and actually I ended up working uh, in his lab um, and from this, I really learned that plant pathogens matter. They've shaped human history uh, and have the potential to shape uh, the future of humanity in positive ways if we can, uh, if we can help uh, in some senses. Um, and then this system, uh, Phytophthora, is such an impressive pathogen. Uh, and so it starts out growing biotrophically through tissue without causing disease, and then it just like suddenly overnight can sporulate. So you have this green tissue that has like fluffy white spores and then it just melts. And it just it really stayed with me that a single pathogen can have such uh, different lifestyles even within a single host. So it can have this biotrophic stage where the plant, it seems like doesn't even know it's there. And then suddenly it just completely destroys the plant tissue. Okay, so from there, uh, I decided I really loved research. Um, but I wanted to work with a system that was a little bit more genetically tractable, right? Potatoes are tetraploid and uh, Phytophthora is genetically very challenging to work with. Uh, and I had the great fortune of joining uh, Sharon Long's lab as a PhD student. And Sharon works with this beautiful system of uh, Metacago truncatula, which is a diploid genetically tractable legume that forms a metabolic symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria. Uh, so plants fix carbon, these bacteria fix nitrogen 
And the plant forms this beautiful home for these bacteria where this exchange of carbon for nitrogen occurs, forming the basis of a mutualistic symbiosis. Uh, this system is fantastic for genetics. You can screen for mutants, either in plants or microbes that don't fix nitrogen uh, and have defective nodules. It's a great system for cell biology. This is a figure for my PhD thesis. Um, but it was really in Sharon's lab that I started thinking about the question that I'm going to talk to you about today, um, because it's really implicit in thinking about this system. So how does the plant immune system let rhizobia colonize uh, without making it vulnerable to pathogens? Right? So presumably, they have to downregulate immunity or have immunity uh, suppressed in a way, at least locally, to let rhizobia colonize. And then how does the plant prevent this um, mutualist from becoming pathogenic? It has so much potential to just take a little bit more carbon than the plant has to give and turn into a pathogen. And so how is this balance maintained? Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that actually a lot of the people involved in this seminar are uh, scientific relatives of Sharon, including uh, Raka, who did her PhD with Sharon, uh, who's a co-host, and Jean Harris was a postdoc with Sharon. Um, and so in Sharon's lab, I really started thinking about the question of, are pathogens and mutualists really so different? While the system seems completely polar opposite from, the, uh, from Phytophthora potato, um, the potential for rhizobia to become a pathogen really begs the question of whether pathogens and mutualists are, are really uh, different in all cases. Um, so this was a review that came out during my PhD and really influenced my thinking. Uh, and this is a phylogenetic tree of the alpha protea bacteria. And so within this tree, um, cyanorhizobium is the nitrogen fixing model <clears throat> that Sharon's lab or nitrogen fixing bacterium that Sharon's lab works on. Uh, and its closest relative on this tree is Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is a plant pathogen. Uh, and these are so closely related that it's been proposed that they uh, should actually be in the same genus. And so over a very short evolutionary distance, we have very different lifestyles between closely related bacteria. Um, not only that, but on this tree, we have uh, animal pathogens. So Brucella and Bartonella, which are pathogens of, of mammals and arthropods, are very close relatives of these nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And in fact, they're more closely related to these bacteria than they are to Brady rhizobium, which is another nitrogen-fixing uh, bacterium. And so while it's possible that each of these uh, groups of bacteria independently evolved the ability to be host associated and then evolved their lifestyle on hosts, um, a more parsimonious explanation is that an ancestor of these bacteria was host associated and the specific lifestyle, whether it's a pathogen or a mutualist, evolved more recently. Um, and there's actually a, a lot of evidence to suggest this. So Brucella and Cyanorhizobium use similar virulence or symbiosis factors to colonize their really different hosts. Um, so you can actually observe this pattern on a scale of genus. So this is the tree of Pseudomonas, uh, which is what my lab uh, currently studies. And within the genus Pseudomonas, we have really diverse lifestyles and of, uh, of microbes uh, and really diverse hosts. So this group, uh, Pseudomonas syringi, is probably the most infamous of the, pseud of the Pseudomonas, which are plant pathogens. Um, there's also Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which are animal pathogens uh, and occasionally plant pathogens or symbionts. Um, and then Pseudomonas fluorescens, which are, can be free living, they can be commensal, um, and occasionally they can even be opportunistic pathogens. Um, and so lifestyle transitions and even transitions between hosts can, be, can occur within a single genus. Uh, and again, I think the most parsimonious explanation is that an ancestor of Pseudomonas was host associated and then Pseudomonas adopted these lifestyles more recently. Um, and I also want to acknowledge my postdoc advisor, Fred Osabel, who is really instrumental in thinking about uh, this question in this way and sort of the shared virulence factors that bacteria require to infect plants and animals. Um, and so there's been uh, more evidence in recent years supporting this idea that transitions along this continuum actually can occur over very short evolutionary distances. Um, the first case I'm aware of uh, is was from uh, Rose Loria's lab in 2005, where they showed that uh, horizontal transfer of a virulence island in Streptomyces could turn a commensal into a pathogen that caused potato scab. So just transfer of a single island. Um, there's also uh, 
a more recent example from Jeff Chang's lab at Oregon State showing that rhodococcus through gain and loss of a single virulence plasmid could turn rhodococcus from a commensal to a pathogen. Uh, and then my lab has a paper from a couple years ago showing that within the pseudomonas fluorescence clade, gain and loss of a few genomic islands can result in transition from pathogen to commensal. Um, and so I think these support something that to some extent we've known all along, if rhizobia, for instance, loses the ability to fix nitrogen, now it has the potential to be a commensal where it's just living in association with the plants and not providing a benefit, or even a pathogen if it's still taking nutrients from the plant and not providing anything back. And so transition across this spectrum can potentially occur over short evolutionary distances. Um, and so that uh, got me thinking that maybe this isn't the continuum that I should be thinking about in answering this question, um, but rather the continuum of, of symbiosis. So to become a pathogen, commensal, or mutualist, you first have to become symbiotic. Um, and so uh, in the review, we've sort of approached it from this perspective, so that actually maybe symbiosis came first, and then transitions between lifestyles occurred uh, over shorter evolutionary time. And so the first stage in becoming symbiotic is to go from a soil microbe to being able to colonize plant tissues. Um, and these can come in the form of, of commensals or even mutualists, such as in the plant microbiome. But we also know that if the plant immune system or uh, stress occurs, then these members of the microbiota can become pathogens. And this is a figure from a recent paper from Sheng Yang He's group showing that um, in immunocompromised plants, the microbiota can become opportunistic pathogens. And then over time, over tens of millions of years, uh, microbes evolve symbiosis or virulence factors where they can signal to plants. And then plants have evolved the ability to recognize and respond to a number of these factors. Uh, and then over hundreds of millions of years, we can have these more, uh, more highly specialized symbioses. The most extreme case are things like chloroplasts and mitochondria, um, but also AM fungi is an obligate symbiont uh, that evolved over hundreds of millions of years. And we also have obligate pathogens. Um, I think lifestyle transitions between pathogen and commensal or symbiont or uh, mutualist are less likely to be occurring in these obligate cases, uh, but there's lots of evidence that they're occurring um, even within an individual uh, in real time uh, for these less specialized associations. Um, and so the question that uh, we, we uh, or the perspective that we tackled this from in the review is how do plants engage in symbiosis and then decide whether to initiate programs of immunity or mutualism? Um, and so the first step in symbiotic engagement is to become symbiotic. And so, um, uh, soil living bacteria, if it wants to have access to the carbon and nutrients that are available from the plant, uh, it has to actually live in association with the plant. And so this requires things like overcoming non-host defenses, um, sensing the presence of a host, they have to evade any basal immune responses like antimicrobial um, compounds, uh, and they have to compete with other microbes. I want to mention that there's so many of the other top 10 questions that ended up coming up as we were thinking about this review that I've actually mapped all uh, all nine of the other questions on to uh, uh, this uh, slide here. Um, and so we really tried to focus on the aspects of this that did not have a huge amount of overlap so that we didn't end up you know, re-reviewing non-host defenses because that was uh, review number six, which was uh, recently published. Okay, so once symbiotic, then the plant has to decide whether it's a pathogen or a mutualist. And in some cases, it might just decide to not do anything. Um, and so microbes gain the ability to promote uh, virulence or symbiosis, and then receptor-mediated recognition has the potential to distinguish pathogens and mutualists. Um, and then finally, plants will induce a, a pathway of symbiosis or immunity. And then the final aspect of the review is fine-tuning the immune thermostat. So how do plants integrate extrinsic and intrinsic signals, so things like development and abiotic stress and nutrient status, to fine-tune these symbiotic interactions? The uh, basis of many mutualistic symbioses is metabolic. Um, and so if a plant has enough nutrients, they might want to actually dynamically regulate that process over time. Uh, and so this is the first fi uh, figure of our review. 
Um, and in this, we describe uh, mechanistic explanations that could encompass both mutualists and pathogens in shaping uh, plant microbe interactions and as well as the microbiome. Um, and so first we talk about how plants can select with metabolites, either to recruit beneficial microbes through sending signals or providing nutrients that only some microbes can use, or producing antimicrobials that exclude pathogens. Um, then we talk about how plants could actually use pairs of receptors to distinguish pathogens from symbionts and, uh, uh, sorry, pathogens from mutual and initiate programs of immunity or symbiosis. Um, and this is really uh, insight from David. So he's going to talk to you about this. Um, and he came up with a really elegant model of how plants could use dual receptors to not just tell uh, mutualists from pathogen, but actually the type of mutualist or pathogen and initiate the appropriate program. Uh, and then finally, I'll talk about how uh, external and internal cues um, work to fine tune the immune thermostat and change these interactions dynamically over the life of a plant. Um, so first I want to talk to you a, a little bit about how plants can use metabolites um, to shape the uh, microbiome and associations with pathogens and mutualists. And so first, plants have signals that attract only specific microbes. And so here in this little diagram, uh, the purple circle is secretion of metabolites. Uh, and in this instance, it would be a signal in purple that uh, sends a signal only to the mutualists, the blue ones, and not the pathogens. Um, the second is that plants can provide nutrients that only some microbes can use. And so in that case, only the blue microbes would be able to use this purple nutrient and not the, the pathogenic microbes. And then finally, plants can make antimicrobial compounds that are toxic to, for instance, just the pathogens and not the mutualists. And so I'm going to go through a few recent examples from the literature of each of these. Um, and so actually, this is not a recent example, but it's uh, one of my favorite uh, classic examples uh, and work that was initiated in Sharon Longsam, um, that plants can secrete uh, flavonoids that are recognized specifically by a bacterial transcription factor, not D, uh, which turns on expression of uh, genes that encode the enzymes to make nod factor. Um, and so this is a case where plants produce a very specific signal to call to a very specific mutualist. Uh, and this theme has also been found in arbuscular mycorrhizal symbiosis, where under phosphate stress, plants produce strigolactones, um, and then strigolactones induce germination of uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal spores that then uh, find the plants and initiate symbioses. Uh, it's possible that there's similar mechanisms that regulate the microbiome, uh, and there's a few examples that are suggestive of this that I'll uh, talk about, but um, we have not found many other examples of this specific of an interaction. Um, so a recent paper from Ann Osborne's lab uh, explored the uh, biosynthesis of triterpenes, which are a large group of plant specialized metabolites, and found that they actually mediate establishment of the microbiome. Um, and so they used a combination of metabolomics and genome mining uh, and genetics, and they characterized this triterpene network in Rabidopsis roots. And they found actually that the single class of molecules plays really diverse roles in shaping the microbiome. So some of the triterpenes promote bacterial growth. Uh, and so the orange bacteria here are actually attracted by triterpenes. Um, so this is potentially a, a signaling molecule like flavonoids or strigolactones. Um, others can serve as carbon sources. And so uh, in this case here, these purple bacteria can metabolize this uh, thalianyl fatty acid esters and use them as a carbon source. And then there's others uh, such as this arabidin that inhibit uh, specific bacteria. And so here, a single class of molecules not only provides nutrients that some microbes can use, but can also attract uh, and inhibit other classes of microbes to shape the microbiome. Uh, another uh, really beautiful recent example is from, uh, this is from Beth Sotley's lab with contributions from Paul Schulze Leffert. Um, and they found that plant-derived coumarins have antimicrobial activity but against some but not all microbiota. Um, and so they looked at uh, mutants that are deficient in biosynthesis of specialized metabolites, and then looked at how those root exudates um, from those mutants shape a synthetic community of microbes. 
Um, and uh, they, there's a lot in this paper, but I just want to highlight um, that, for instance, a mutant that's deficient in Coumarin production, so this F61H mutant that can't make Coumarin, um, the synthetic community is uh, specifically enriched in Pseudomonas. So you have more Pseudomonas uh, here, suggesting that this Coumarin normally acts to inhibit Pseudomonas. Um, and then there's some other examples as well. So like loss of glucosinolate biosynthesis uh, seems to result in reduction of uh, this member of the microbiome, suggesting that glucosinolates may be attracting or recruiting or providing a, a nutrient source for uh, these microbiota. Uh, and so collectively, these examples, they're just two of many, many uh, current examples, but suggest that plant uh, specialized metabolism may play a really important role in shaping interactions with microbes. Um, so once symbiotic, plants must then determine whether a microbe is friend or foe. And so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, David to uh, talk to you about how plants could use pairs of receptors uh, to make this decision. All right, so yeah, I'll be focusing on the second part of the review, uh, distinguish, distinguishing plants from foe, or sorry, distinguishing pathogens from, from friends. <clears throat> um, so the plant microbiome, in this case, I'll be focusing on the roots, uh, so this uh, blue section highlighted. Uh, so the plant rhizosphere is assembled from microbes um, in the surrounding environment, in this case, the soil. Um, and microbes that are able to survive within the host vicinity, um, which Kara was talking about earlier, may undergo further selection by the plant immune system. Um, but for optimal growth, plants must use uh, immunity sparingly uh, to distinguish friend from foe. Um, there is a growth uh, defense trade-off in which when a plant activates uh, its immune response, it shifts resources from uh, growth and development towards uh, defense. Um, but in this case, plant roots are constantly in the soil, which is uh, constantly ex exposed to different microbes. So it wouldn't make sense uh, from a plant growth perspective to always focus on eliminating every microbe that it comes in contact with. Instead, it should focus mainly on um, distinguishing which microbes are harmful um, versus which ones are friends, or uh, commensals, or mutualists. Um, however, this uh, question is poorly understood, how plants distinguish pathogens from commensals. And this is the question that, that my research is most interested in. Um, and one of the, the most well-studied or common ways that we know plants can perceive microbes in their environment um, are through these highly conserved microbe-associated molecular patterns. Uh, which I'll refer to as MAPS, but um, also historically have been called PAMPS. Um, plants are able to recognize MAPS from uh, microbes across all sorts of dif different kingdoms of life, um, such as bacteria, fungi, uh, oomycetes, um, and even some animals such as nematodes. Um, plants are able to perceive MAPS through these uh, pattern recognition receptors, these PRRs, shown in this diagram in, in green, um, which are able to associate uh, with extracellular MAPs and induce uh, some sort of immune response. Um, I, I say some immune response because, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and this immune response is generally referred to as pattern-triggered immunity. Um, but I think it's important to point out that the majority of studies of PTI or pattern triggered immunity uh, has been done in leaves. Um, and we generally think that there's a lot of similar mechanisms between uh, what occurs during immune response in leaves versus roots. Um, but I have this uh, figure from one of my favorite papers illustrating that um, there are some differences. Um, mainly that whenever you treat plants with a lot of different elicitors, um, that usually induce immune response, you tend to see a very restricted, either spatially 
or just a weak induction of immunity. Uh, so walking through this figure, um, this is moving along the position of the root, starting at the root cap, going up to the maturation zone. Um, and in green um, is a fluorescent indicator um, for the plant immune response. Um, so you can see that uh, in general, there's a um, low level of, of plant immunity uh, or induction of immune associated genes in the root cap uh, and not so much in the rest of the root. And even after uh, treatment with a very common map, uh, flag 22, you still see a very weak or hardly any response. Um, and same with chitin, um, almost no response um, or chitin treatment in the root. However, when treated with uh, another molecule, which I'll talk to later, talk about later, uh, PEP1, uh, you see a much stronger induction of immunity in the roots. Um, so again, I'll bring up PEP1 again uh, later on in my talk. Um, so are MEMS sufficient our MAMPs are a sufficient mechanism for distinguishing pathogens from commensals. Um, I would argue not really, but uh, before I get to that, I'll show you another way that plants can uh, perceive mic microbes in their environment. Um, so microbes are able to use molecules known as effectors to interfere with uh, various cellular processes. Um, and I have effectors shown here in red. Um, and there's a lot of information on this slide, but I just generally want to show the, the vast diversity of effectors that microbes have involved to interfere with all sorts of different processes within plant cells. Um, and this is either by hijacking uh, plant metabolism for the benefit of the microbe or blocking plant immunity. Um, and this is just showing that uh, some specialized, highly specialized pathogenic bacteria are able to use uh, the type 3 secretion system to inject infectors into a plant cell, uh, which can then go on to uh, interfere with all sorts of different, of all sorts of different um, processes, such as the MAP kinase cascades, uh, the cell skeleton, um, and vesicle trafficking, uh, along with uh, directly uh, interfering with uh, PTI, pattern trigger immunity. Um, but in return, plants have uh, evolve ways to uh, detect these uh, interferences by microbes um, through NLRs, um, which aren't shown here. But NLRs are uh, proteins that plants have that are able to either directly or indirectly detect the presence of effectors. Um, and this recognition through NLRs are uh, able to then induce uh, a strong induction of defense associated genes, um, commonly referred to as ETI or effector triggered immunity. Um, so, putting these two ideas together, uh, there's this nice classical perspective or model uh, in which you have two pathways that um, lead to a defense response. You have this first um, uh, pattern triggered immune response um, after plants. Uh, re receive maps uh, that bind to PRRs. Uh, you get this nice uh, small induction of immunity. Uh, and in return, uh, microbes have evolved effectors that can block uh, pattern triggered immunity, uh, leading to what's referred to as effector triggered susceptibility. Um, but then, in return, again, in an evolutionary arms race, plants have evolved uh, NLRs, which are able to then perceive defectors uh, and then lead to a stronger induction of immunity. Um, but more recently, it's been shown that plants can only recognize MAMPs and effectors, but they can also recognize uh, wounding or self-damage. Um, and these are often referred to um, as damage-associated molecular patterns. Um, which are pretty much molecules that are uh, derived from uh, larger macromolecules um, that are either intracellular or extracellular. Um, and after uh, damps have been released, uh, either by cleavage from a larger molecule or just released from the cytoplasm in general uh, into extracellular space, uh, they're able to bind to extracellular receptors and then induce immune response. So, 
this is just a nice example of a very commonly studied uh, damp, uh, PEP1, um, which is uh, derived from a larger macromolecule, this protein ProPEP1, which is embedded in the tenoclast. Uh, so after damage or wounding, in this case, this is a, a wounding, artificial wounding induced by a laser. Uh, so after laser ablation, there is a calcium influx, which activates this MC4, this metacaspase 4, which then cleaves uh, ProPEP1, um, which is embedded in the toplas, but it cleaves it on the, on the cell plasmic side, uh, releases uh, PEP1, uh, which is able to uh, diffuse through this wounded site and bind to uh, extracellular uh, pepper, pepper 1 and 2 receptors. And then that leads to a very strong induction of immune response, uh, which is what I showed you before with those fluorescent images, um, showing that AT PEP1 leads to a very potent or very powerful immune response. Um, so taking that idea together with uh, the presence of MAPS, uh, this is a, a first introduction of a dual input system in which plants use a combination of damage and MAPS to coordinate a immune response. Uh, so in this model from uh, a paper that just came out, I think uh, last year, uh, this is showing that when you have uh, wounding on its own, so laser ablation of uh, cells, you don't really get much of a defense response. Um, versus whenever you have MAMPS alone in the root, uh, which is illustrated here, these little bacteria, you don't, you also don't get much of an immune response uh, when they're just MAMPS only. But when you combine the two together, you get a much uh, more potent and much par more powerful immune response. Um, and this brings forth uh, two ideas. Um, one, that uh, a immune response can be localized uh, to just a few adjacent cells around the damaged cell. Uh, and two, it's a, a dual input system or a dual input process in which um, you have very low uh, expression of FLS2, which is the receptor that recognizes uh, Pagellin. Um, but after laser ablation, you increase the expression of FLS2 so that these cells are now uh, expressing FLS2 and able to recognize uh, flagellum when it's present. Um, so in this case, you have both uh, FLS2 and uh, flagellum present, and then that can lead to induction of uh, pattern-triggered immunity. Um, and here's a, another model that came out this year, I think. Um, showing another dual input system uh, in which uh, this is dealing with ETI, uh, effector triggered immunity, and PTI. Um, so you have extracellular receptors and intracellular receptors that are working together to lead to uh, pathogen resistance. So in this case, in gray, uh, there is a, this is illustrating a mutant cell, so a cell that uh, has several mutants for uh, PRR, so it's unable to receive MAPS from, uh, this, in this case, bacteria. Um, but the bacteria is still able to inject effectors to the type 3 secretion system, uh, which does lead to some uh, increase in PTI-associated genes, um, but uh, not enough of immune response that actually leads to uh, any sort of induction of ROS or, or a strong induction of ROS or uh, resistance against the pathogen. However, in this case, uh, you have a wall type cell uh, which is able to receive uh, MAMPS and also at the same time able to receive effectors um, in which you have a combination of these uh, two inputs uh, leading into or feeding into uh, an immune pathway. Um, in which ETI boosts uh, the components of PTI um, and leads to a much stronger um, induction of ROS or a much stronger ROS burst, uh, which is then able to lead to a, a powerful resistance against the, the pathogen. Um, 
Okay. So putting all this together, I have uh, what I'm going to refer to as the dual input model uh, for plant micro recognition. And I'm going to break this model down into uh, two parts, uh, which I'll try to show here in yellow. Um, the first part pretty much illustrates that plants use a combination of extracellular and intracellular receptors to screen for uh, disruptions in cell physiology. Um, so in this case, it's combining the ability to recognize MAMPs, uh, which I have a uh, highlight here in purple, uh, versus uh, either damps or effectors, which the receptors for those I have highlighted in red. So it's essentially the ability to recognize uh, MAMPs versus the ability to recognize uh, disruptions uh, in cell physiology, whether that is a physical disruption to the cell wall or the cell membrane or uh, metabolic disruption uh, or uh, blocking of plant immunity. Uh, so I think these could also be referred to as uh, danger signals, which uh, again indicates the plant that's being attacked by some uh, outside invader. Um, so I think uh, putting these ideas together, you have uh, strong induction or a stronger induction of plant immunity from just uh, danger signals alone and uh, weaker induction of plant immunity from MAMPS alone, uh, illustrated again through the zigzag model. Uh, but when you combine these both together, uh, which is, I think, how they usually occur um, in nature, you get a much stronger and, and actually a synergistic response um, and induction of basal immunity pathways. Um, one second. Okay, and the second part of this um, is a focus on uh, on maps because I guess you could say in the first part it seems that um, if a plant was concerned with just telling whether or not uh, a microbe was friendly, it could do so based on the presence of effectors or damps or maybe even both. Uh, it's just an indicator to show that there's a microbe in the vicinity or something's is some organism is doing harm to the plant. Um, but I also think it's important um, to actually identify where this uh, damage is coming from. So I, I don't think it's any mistake that uh, plants have evolved uh, two ways to perceive uh, organisms, whether or not it's the uh, damage that they're inducing or the, uh, the type of map that the that the microbes is producing. Um, and I think it's it's cool that plants can perceive so many different types of maps um, across different kingdoms of life. Um, and I think one use for that could be um, that being, being able to recognize uh, where the microbe is coming from, you could give the appropriate uh, physiological response to actually start to eliminate or provide it for a resistance against that uh, microbe. Uh, so, for example, um, I think uh, a immune response against a nematode versus a fungus would have a lot of overlap in immunity signaling pathways and again in the growth defense trade off. But I also think that um, there would be some physiological differences for um, inhibiting growth or providing resistance against a fungal pathogen versus a nematode versus a bacterial pathogen. Um, and again, I think there would be a lot of overlap between these pathways in general, but I do think there would be some, um, some areas that don't overlap and that are specific to uh, the type of, uh, of organism that's attacking it. Uh, and again, I think that specificity would come from uh, the presence of maps, being able to tell if the map is, uh, cons or is conserved amongst uh, fungal pathogens or bacteria. In this case, we're using chitin to illustrate a fungal pathogen since chitin is uh, often associated with uh, fungi. Um, and another idea I think this illustrates um, is that I think evolutionary speaking, some of these combinations may be more likely to occur than others. Um, so I think 
depending on the lifestyle of the organism and what uh, branch of life it's from, uh, you may have uh, some maps that are more often paired with certain types of effectors or certain uh, types of dabs. And there are a whole slew of dabs I haven't shown, but um, dabs can range from um, extracellular, or sorry, cell wall um, molecules such as cell bios. Uh, it can be extracellular ATP, extracellular DNA, uh, and other uh, intracellular peptides. Um, so yeah, so putting these ideas together, uh, for example, I think if you're thinking about what sorts of danger signals a nematode would uh, provide to a plant versus a bacteria, I think uh, nematodes are able to use their uh, mouths to induce large amounts of damage since they have piercing mouth parts. Uh, so you're more likely to get uh, a lot more lice cells and therefore uh, release of some large intracellular molecules uh, like PEP1, uh, which is a fairly large molecule compared to other damps such as uh, ATP. So I think you would possibly see more, uh, you would see a combination of maps from nematodes uh, combined with uh, larger uh, damps in combination versus for uh, a pathogen such as a bacteria or a fungal pathogen even, you may see more um, damps are associated with cell wall degradation uh, and then combine that in the presence with either a map or a, uh, sorry, a bacterial map or a fungal map, uh, therefore indicating that you have a bacterial pathogen that is dealing some extensive damage, maybe not as much as a nematode or as dramatic, dramatic as a, as a nematode. So, yeah. Uh, so tying these ideas together uh, into my own research, I just want to show a little, a little teaser uh, to what I've been working on. Um, so I am studying a system of uh, beneficial pathogenic pseudomonas on roots, um, and the two strains of pseudomonas that I'm using uh, are highly uh, identical, over 99% uh, RNA. Um, 16 SR ribosomal RNA identity. Um, so I, I think it's safe to assume that uh, most of the maps that these two uh, bacteria would be producing would be highly similar um, and pretty much indistinguishable to the plant. Yet, I think uh, based on these results, uh, these are um, gene expression uh, done through qPCR for three different defense-associated genes. Um, no. For some reason, you can't see the my labels. Just, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is for buffer treatment, uh, the commensal bacteria, the pathogen, uh, and then the avirulent pathogen, mutant. Uh, and you can clearly see that there's um, dramatic induction or high induction of uh, of these three defense associated genes only in the presence of the uh, virulent pathogen and not in the mutant. Um, and I think taken together, this suggests that uh, plants probably are using some sort of dual input system where the map is enough to distinguish between uh, friend or foe, but you also need some sort of danger signal. In this case, uh, the pathogen isn't a very specialized pathogen, it's an opportunistic pathogen. So there aren't effectors uh, that are being used to uh, interfere with plant metabolism. But I do think the pathogen is able to induce some sort of damage or at least provide uh, some sort of danger signal um, based on the, the gene that I'm knocking out. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's all I have on my side. So back to Kara. Okay. Um, thanks so much, David. Okay. Um, so I just have about five more minutes to uh, wrap up the overview of our review. Um, so David just told you uh, his model of how plants can sense a combination of, um, of MAMPs 
uh, along with either symbiosis signals. Um, so he, uh, Jan contributed a bit to that part of the review uh, for symbiosis signals or uh, danger signals to not only tell if it's a friend or foe, but what kind of, if it's a fungus or a bacterial uh, symbiont. Um, and so for the last couple minutes, I'm going to talk about how plants can fine tune their immune thermostat, uh, depending on intrinsic and extrinsic cues. And so because the basis of many symbioses is metabolic, plants must be able to coordinate nutrient status and immunity to maintain symbi symbiotic homeostasis, right? If you have enough nutrients, then you might not want to engage in symbiosis. Or if you don't have nutrients to spare, you might not want to engage in, in symbiosis. Um, and then the plant immune status and microbiome um, uh, change in response to a variety of developmental uh, abiotic and biotic cues. Um, and again, this may be a way to, uh, to conserve nutrients or recruit beneficial microbes just in the space and time that they're needed. Um, and then finally, in thinking about what this sort of baseline set point is for the immune thermostat, uh, emergent evidence is really revealing that the microbiome uh, is critical in how we think about the baseline of plant immunity. Um, and so first, I want to start with a classic example from Rhizobia legume symbiosis, where it's known that under low nitrate levels, uh, legumes recruit rhizobia and form these nitrogen fixing nodules. Um, if you treat plants with uh, nitrate, the plants will actually kick out the bacteria. So they uh, senesce nodules and um, disengage in symbiosis. Uh, and so this makes a lot of sense, uh, right? If you don't need nitrogen, why would you spend energy feeding bacteria um, that provide you with a nutrient that you don't use? Uh, and there's been some really beautiful recent studies uh, showing mechanistically how this works and that um, a combination of NINs and NLPs uh, coordinate sensing of nitrogen status and integrating that with plant immunity to regulate nodulation. And so we're getting a more mechanistic understanding of how the plants actually can integrate uh, nutrient status and immunity. Um, there's some great examples in the microbiome as well, although mechanistically we don't um, understand how these work as well. These are two of my favorite examples showing that the rice microbiome changes over development. Um, this is from the Sundaresian lab at UC Davis. Uh, and the colors of the plants are, uh, they're colored by age over time. Um, and you can see that there's this beautiful shift in the microbiome. Uh, and it, this was to the point that they could actually predict plant age from the microbiome. Um, similarly, the sorghum microbiome, um, as well as the rice microbiome, are known to shift in response to drought stress. And so again, uh, drought-treated plants are shown here in red. And so you can see this shift in the microbiome that correlates with, uh, with water or drought status in the plants. Uh, and then there's some more recent work, this is from the coleman Dur lab, um, that shows that these changes really do uh, seem to matter, that the shifts in bacterial taxa can potentially be protective against drought stress. And so um, it's really, uh, fascinating that plants might be able to integrate uh, things like uh, drought, stress, or development to shift their microbiome in ways that are beneficial. Um, we also uh, are learning that plant receptor kinases involved in immunity or development can also shape the microbiome. Um, and so this is a current example from my lab. Um, it's on BioArchive and in, in press at Nature Plants. Um, where we found that feronia kinase, which is involved in both development and immunity, uh, is involved in recruitment of beneficial pseudomonas. And so um, by treating plants with a ligand of feronia, we could see uh, shifts in levels of pseudomonas fluorescence. Uh, and there's also some nice examples from uh, Sheng Yang He's group showing that immunity receptor kinases are involved in uh, shaping the microbiome. Uh, and so collectively, these uh, findings show that plants can, uh, both in response to external cues and then intrinsic cues like development or um, our peptide signals, can shape their microbiome over their uh, life. So um, these examples show that the microbiome, as well as interactions with mutualists and pathogens uh, can shift over the life of a plant and that the plant may be able to dial up and down their immune thermostat depending on what their needs are and what their status is. However, to understand this, we really need to understand what the baseline is. So what's the immune set point for a plant growing outside in the world that's interacting with all of these pathogens and commensals uh, and mutualists? Um, and that's made a uh, 
or a lot of us, I think, realize that we know more about the immune status of germ-free plants than we do about uh, soil-grown plants or plants growing in the environment. Um, and so these are two recent examples. Um, this one just came out in uh, PNES uh, from Paolo Tixiara uh, uh, from Jeff Dengel's lab, and Paolo now has his own lab in Brazil. Um, and this is an example from Roland Brenderson with some contributions from my lab. And so when you treat plants with flagellin, and these are germ-free plants, you can get responses like stunting of roots or induction of gene response or gene expression uh, here shown by a guest reporter. It turns out that many members of the microbiome can suppress these responses. Um, and so this is an example of a microbiome suppressing the root growth inhibition by flagellin and uh, gene expression uh, induced by flagellin. And so when we think about things like uh, PTI and immune responses, it's entirely possible that soil grown plants, because they have these complex communities of microbes, may not actually respond uh, in the roots. Uh, or even in the leaves. So we haven't really uh, explored the role of the microbiota uh, in, um, in suppressing PTI in the leaves. Uh, this is a picture of an Arabidopsis that was growing outside my house. Uh, it really likes to grow in the cool weather of Vancouver. Um, but we know a lot more about the immune set point of these germ-free plants than we do about this plant that clearly has had some uh, herbivores come and visit it. Uh, and so I think going forward, it's really important to start trying to integrate across these different scales and trophic levels to understand what the baseline immunity set point is and then how it changes over the life of an individual. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm gonna come back to this summary slide. Um, and so we talked about the rules of symbiotic engagement where you first have to become symbiotic. And to do that, we talked about the role of metabolites in shaping uh, the microbiome, um, as well as interactions with pathogens and mutualists. Um, but there's of course, a lot of other factors that uh, have to come into play to become symbiotic. Um, and then David proposed a model about how dual receptors could be used to distinguish friend and foe. Uh, and then finally, we talked about how plants can fine tune their immune thermostat over the course of their life. Uh, and I again, just wanna highlight how many other questions in the top 10 question this touches on. And so um, uh, question uh, 10 was uh, about ecological context. Um, and so I think that's really exciting going forward, thinking about how uh, plants engage with beneficial microbes while restricting pathogens. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'll stop and we'll be happy to answer questions. Kara, sorry, I'm still there. Kara and David, thank you for an excellent and very interesting discussion of this um, big, exciting question. Uh, we will now take question, take a uh, Sorry, I'm just rearranging my slide here, my screen. Um, we now take questions from the Q&A box. I see people have been typing in a lot. And I just wanted to remind people who tuned in later that my co-host today is Raka Mitra, who is the MPMI podcast editor, host and producer of our podcast, Microgreens. And um, let's, let's start, let's see what we have here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the question from Vanya Pankovitz, who is also first author on a very interesting review article uh, that's coming out in next month's issue. So keep an eye out for that, uh, looking uh, on the topic that she writes her question on. So her question is, how do you fit in this model the nitrogen fixing bacteria that for years associate with monocots, but don't form nodules and are not soil living bacteria, such as azospirillum and azoarchus? I'm gonna turn that over to Kara and David. Um, yeah, so I probably think about those the way that I think about um, uh, members of the microbiome. Um, I, you know, I don't know if there's specific signals, uh, and so you might know more about that. Um, but you know, I'd still say that they have to become symbiotic. They still have to use plant nutrients and sense the plants. Um, and then, you know, whether, yeah, I guess maybe I'm not sure what part of this model you're, you're asking about, but um, I think the, the sort of general microbiome model uh, should work for a number of mutualists that maybe don't have the same highly evolved mutualistic symbioses as, uh, as symbiotic nitrogen fixing rhizobia or as uh, the mutualist ones that form nodules. 
Okay, we have another question that uh, from Sudeep Adhikari, who's um, asking, uh, why do necrotrophic pathogens require dead tissue for their survival? Why can't they grow on living tissue? Um, David, you can feel free to chime in. So I'm not an expert on all aspects of pathogenesis. Um, you know, I think for why microbes have different lifestyles and can grow on different tissue types, I think a lot of that is the like the enzyme repertoire that they possess to um, either you know kill tissue or use the corresponding nutrients, um, and whether they can actually actively suppress immunity. So it might. Um, idea about biotrophs is that they use effectors to suppress immunity to sort of actively colonize live tissue and necotrophs might lack that. Um, but that's definitely outside of my area of expertise. And we have a lot of experts in plant immunity here. So if someone in the audience has insights, I would uh, be excited for people to type in the chat their perspectives on these as well. So um, yes, and I think also one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this continuum that that Kara and David were talking about is not just across different microbes, but even within the time scale of an interaction. So there are many interactions that might start off kind of neutral, transition to maybe a biotrophic, and there are many necrotrophs go through a biotrophic stage. Um, similarly, even beneficials, uh, everybody's out for a free lunch and they're looking to eat something at the end. So, so you can't really compartmentalize completely. So I think I think at some level they do, right? They do probably for at least part of the time um, find something to eat. Okay, um, Siyama Chatterton asks, many root rot pathogens of legume plants also recognize specific flavonoid compounds released from the plant and contribute to their host specificity. Are these flavonoid compounds the same for both beneficial rhizobium and plant pathogens? And does that further complicate distinguishing friend from foe? Great question. Um, yeah, so again, this is not my area of expertise. Um, Jean and Raka might be better able to comment on this. Um, I actually don't know if the flavonoid compounds are the same for beneficial rhizobium and plant pathogens. Um, if it, they were, I certainly think that would further complicate things. Um, there's certainly some good emergent evidence that ectomycorrhizal fungi um, and pathogenic fungi can produce similar LCOs that are recognized by the plant. Um, but in terms of those early initiating symbiosis stages, I'm not sure. Okay, we have a question from Damian Cambiano, um, who's asking uh, more broadly about this, um, this interaction. So they ask, do plants decide <laughs> decide in quotes to activate defenses or mutualism programs or do microbes force the plants to induce them uh, they want to know who's deciding are they deciding together um, and what's the does one side have more molecular evidence than the other Wait, should i try to answer this question yes okay. absolutely um yeah I, I never actually thought about from the perspective of trying or who's making the decision um, I guess I would say the microbes are making the decision, or maybe they're deciding together. Um, I think the plants are just are, are have all these receptors just to, to scan for different inputs. So they're scanning for uh, homeostasis and whether or not microbes are disrupting that. So I would think that if there's no disruption um, from the plant's perspective, then the plant doesn't really have much of a reason to initiate such a costly defense response um, because again there's there's a trade-off whether or not you want to attack every uh, microbe um, in the vicinity versus focus on growth and development um, so yeah i still don't know how to decide or i don't know how to phrase who's deciding uh, maybe they're deciding together i guess the pathogen is deciding to attack the plant for survival and the plants are deciding to attack the pathogen for survival I don't know if that answers the question. But at some level, as you pointed out with the damps, at some level, the plant kind of is making a decision. It's saying, without the damage, I'm not going to bother, you know, and that keeps it very localized, right? You don't have to have a whole plant response. You can keep it, you know, really at that 
cellular level. So, uh, and the next question is in the same general direction. And I just want to remind people when you have a question to please type them in the Q&A box, because that's where we're reading from. Um, so Eliza Liu asks, regarding the dual input model, so this is, this is back to the section that David was talking about, some pathogens and mutualists share common MAMPs and mutualists also induce damage, therefore DAMPs. In this instance, how does this model recognize the what is part of the connection? Uh, okay, nice, I'll try this one. Um, yeah, so I think the, the model right now ignores uh, the fact that um, bacteria can suppress uh, immunity. Um, so I, I don't know too much about mutualists, but I think mutualists do have uh, ways of suppressing uh, plant immunity, such as reducing the number of PRRs um, that plant cells are expressing. Um, I didn't, I wasn't aware that mutualists were inducing damage, or I'm not sure how much or what type of damage they're inducing, but I could, I would think that maybe uh, mutualists um, have some sort of, um, I didn't talk about the other side of the model, the, the side in blue, the, the mutualistic um, pathways, but I would think that maybe uh, signaling through mutualist pathways would lead to a reduced um, defense response, and then therefore the plant um, sees the benefit of mutualism and doesn't increase uh, defense response. But yeah, I don't know. So I'm going to jump in here because Eliza Lou has another question. And um, it's uh, when a mutual, what happens when a mutualist releases friend maps like an LCO and the typical maps like fl um, flag 22 that in and induces damps, then what does the plant do? And I just want to point out that in the same special issue that's going to be coming out this month, uh, that is highlighted by uh, or is anchored by the review that we're talking about today. Um, we have a very nice uh, short communication looking at um, this very question that apparently, you know, we always say flag 22 induces uh, defense, but not every flag 22 does. And uh, we have a nice little paper where they're mapping it across uh, different rhizobial taxa and surprise, surprise, a lot of bacteria that are mutualists don't have a flag 22 that uh, activates typical MAMP. So something to think about. Uh, and, and certainly there's a lot of evolutionary, co-evolutionary interplay going on here. Okay, I'll turn it over to you, Raka. Okay, so I'm gonna take, uh, ask the next one, which is from Ryohei Nakano, who asks, uh, does a single cell differentiate microbes or is a matter of cell populations? How many microbial cells or strains can a single plant cell interact with? I'll let you uh, answer that one. That's the cell okay. biologist. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the last part first. Um, I think, Plant cells can act, interact with a lot of uh, microbes. Uh, plant cells are pretty large. I don't. I, I come. I'm coming from hypochondrial cells, so I don't know off the top of my head the dimensions of a root cell. But if I would guess, I think they're like I don't know, ten to twenty microns wide. I'm not sure how long. I guess it depends where you're at in the root, but much longer um, versus a microbe, maybe like one or half a micron to one micron wide versus one to two microns long. So I think you could pack a lot on into a plant root or to a single plant cell. Uh, and that's not even including that they can stack on top of each other when they're forming bowel foams. So yeah, I think they can interact with a lot of different, um, I think a single plant cell can interact with a lot of different microbial cells. Um, but I also think that um, in nature when a plant actually interacts with maybe a pathogen, it may only come in contact with a few pathogenic cells at first, and then maybe those pathogens would start to divide along a single cell. So I, I guess after a short period of time, you have a, a large amount of just pathogenic cells associated with just a few 
um, plant cells. Um, so yeah, when I, when I think of this model, I think of it on a single cell level uh, in plants, um, kind of what I was showing before with those artificial root ablation experiments, um, where you damage a, a single plant cell, or you, you damage a, a few plant cells, and then you have um, an immune response in adjacent plant cells. I, I think that would be happening um, and, and the rhizosphere in general uh, under normal physiological conditions. I, I think it's so interesting that you are um, really focusing on this whole response at a single cell level, because I think that's absolutely true. Um, you can't suddenly have poof, the whole, you know, Arabidopsis is small, but you know, what if you have a soybean? What if you have a grape? What if you have an oak, right? You're not gonna be responding uniformly across the plant. Um, but even within a tissue, this whole very fine single celled response is interesting because that ties into a point that Kenichi Tsuda, who gave our last, our previous seminar, um, pointed out, which is he said the missing, the thing that we're missing in a lot of our studies is not looking at these things at the single cell level, but that, that there's so much information in that heterogeneity of response that we are currently missing. And that's exactly the point that David is, is trying to bring out. Um, and uh, so, okay, so our next question uh, is, is uh, interesting, thinking about this whole integration of information. How does an epidermal cell, and I'm gonna imagine root epidermal cell because I focus on roots and that's what uh, David presented. Um, how does an epidermal cell integrate information from uh, outside and inside? And, and, and this question is about leaves, but my own brain, it's in roots. Um, I'm not sure I have any, um, yeah, I, I don't know. There's a lot of very uh, difficult questions reading through the chat here. Um, yeah, David, if you have any great insights, please chime in. But, you know, I think it's, uh, yeah, I don't even know where to start on this. <laughs> I think this addresses uh, uh, several of our unanswered questions, which tells you what a big, what a good question it is, what a big question. So this touches on um, that connection of ETI and PTI that Kenichi Tsuda talked about last time. If you have um, biotic signals outside the cell and inside the cell, and how are those connected? That's one. And then, you know, our entire next issue, next focus issue is going to be on how does the abiotic environment, so the non-living environment, um, influence the interaction of plants with microbes? And, and how is that all integrated? That's a super good question. Um, what are the nodes? That's something that I'm personally very interested in. What are the nodes? Um, and are there multiple ones? You could imagine it targeting a hormone and um, just as environmental factors dial it up and down. And that kind of comes to that immunity set point that that Kara was discussing. I'm going to go down a little further in the list. Kara, you were pointing out there are a lot of really hard questions. I'm going to point one out um, that's down from Sharon Long, because why not? Um, so Sharon asks, she says, wonderful talks. She says, I don't know if the following question falls into your general topic you've considered, but if so, I'd be curious for your thoughts. I've always wondered about how nodules stay disease free, especially because nodules have no epidermis integrity. Does this create cell wall damage that gets detected? Um, I've also always wondered how nodules stay disease free. And I think with the um, with microbiome sequencing, that we've been finding that maybe, you know, nodules aren't always pure cultures of rhizobia, like I thought about them in grad school. Um, there's actually, you know, communities of microbes in there. Um, yeah, but how, you know, how all of those microbes then, and that community and that, you know, sort of specialized organ then signals to the rest of the plants, uh, I don't know. And I don't know if plants actually can sense damage or um, immune responses from the nodule, or if this nodule is just a completely sort of, you know, um, immunocompromised or immunosuppressed tissue, right? You would think that there has to be some kind of immune signaling going to the plant. Um, but if there was too much immune signaling, you think it would just cause autoimmunity. Um, so I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah, and, and there's that whole question of what what is going on in the infection thread, right? Which is a tube through the cell wall. Like, is there some chewing up of the cell wall there? 
I totally had that question. I was wondering this, I think when, it was probably when David was talking, that like you have these damps. So do the symbionts just not create damps? Is the way that they figured out how to like get into, like really on the outside of the plant cell, is that specific so there isn't damage caused? I don't see how they can make a tunnel through the cell wall without breaking down cell wall components. Right. I just can't imagine it. So yeah, I think damps and so yeah, damps. One of our wonderful paper looking at damps and immune signaling from Antonio Molina's lab. So uh, I'd encourage you to take a look there. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And maybe with this dual receptor model that David's talking about, maybe if you have damps plus beneficial signals like LCOs, maybe that, right? If you're thinking about these as paired um, signals inducing different responses, maybe that's how you get some of that specificity. Good question. Interesting question. Um, okay, oh my gosh, so many interesting questions here in, in the chat. Um, okay, Ludivine um, Gigar, so quite a bit farther down, asks, have you ever found some evidence of pathogenic microbes deceiving the plant? Um, yeah, I think the example I just suggested where um, pathogenic fungi can make uh, LCOs or lipokaito oligosaccharides that look sort of like ectomycorrhizal or mycorrhizal LCOs um, is a great example. Um, you know, it's also possible that things like rhizobia evolved their lipokaito oligosaccharide as a, like, um, through horizontal transfer from fungi, and that that's actually a mutualism that was sort of deceiving the plants, so that rhizobia co-opted um, this mutualistic pathway as a way to, uh, you know, signal with the plants. Um, and then, you know, otherwise, um, what was the rest of that question? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of effectors and, uh, and virulence factors are deceiving the plants, right? They're suppressing immune responses so that the plant doesn't actually know that there's a pathogen there. I found a question a little further down as well um, that we haven't talked about, uh, which is Benjamin Horowitz asks, what about toxic metabolites that pathogens secrete? Uh, could the same molecule trigger both damage and recognition pathways? Um, certain, well, yeah, so if a toxin caused physical damage to a cell, um, certainly that damage could be recognized. Um, I'm not sure of a specific example where a toxin is also directly recognized by a receptor rather than the damage that that toxin does. Um, but theoretically, I think uh, that is certainly possible. Um, I think, you know, there's certainly effectors and MAMPs that are directly recognized by plant receptors. Um, but I think probably a more common theme or a way that plants could recognize a a wider array of microbes, both from the microbiome as well as pathogens and commensals, is to recognize the, the damage um, or the effects on the, the cell. And so I think with effectors, we're seeing more and more that it's actually the, you know, the guard hypothesis that monitoring the damage from those effectors is much more common than direct recognition of the effectors. Okay, I'm going back up to the top. This has been just such a fascinating, wide ranging discussion. I appreciate Kara and David's ability to kind of jump uh, around this very large topic area. So Josna uh, MK asks, do you think there will be a shift in the microbiome in hemibiotrophs once the pathogens continue to live saprophytically? And what do you think the factors involved might be? Yeah, I really think this comes back to that idea of what is the immune set point? Like, what is the baseline level of immunity? Um, and how do all of these 
uh, microbes that a plant normally interacts with play into that. And so plants in the environment are living with you know, thousands or tens of thousands of members of their microbiota. They're casually munched on by insects and, and nematodes might come visit them. Pathogens live on their leaves and most of those don't cause you know, massive disease. Uh, as in things like hemibiotrophs, um, maybe living endophytically inside plants. And so collectively, does that mean that the plant always has some basal level of immune response? Um, or does it mean that the plants, things like PTI are actually really just completely suppressed in, in a soil grown plant. And so then um, it's really, you know, maybe those pathways aren't super important, or maybe it's tissue specific. And so, um, you know, I think a lot of what we know about immunity has focused on leaves and our uh, recent work um, from the community on the microbiome suggests that maybe the microbiome is modulating the root immune system uh, in a way that prevents plant autoimmunity against their microbiota. Um, yes, so it's complicated and I think it's, uh, it's, it really comes back to that question of what is baseline immunity in plants. Can I ask a follow up? I was thinking, I've been thinking about this as you were talking. So in humans, we understand a bit about how a uh, microbiota is established, right? So after birth, right, humans are colonized. And then there's a lot of evidence that there might be some genetic components of the person or the environment. There have been twin studies and stuff. So when you say the baseline immunity of a plant, like, how do you think that baseline immunity is established? You showed this nice uh, microbiome work on rice, for example, that uh, it changes over time. But do you think it's going to almost become more individual based on life history, for example? Yeah, I mean, I started thinking about this a lot because of the animal literature um, where immunity in, in mice, for instance, has always historically been done in the presence of the microbiome. And then when people started looking at germ-free mice, they realized how you know, immunologically messed up they were. If you take away the gut microbiota of a mouse, their gut doesn't de develop properly, their immune system doesn't develop properly. And that made me realize that plants, we've always been looking at germ-free, or not always, but we're often looking at germ-free plants uh, that have changes in root architecture, similar to the changes in gut architecture that you see in a germ-free mouse. Um, um, and uh, changes in um, in immunity, uh, and so you know I, I think because plants across the globe have had to co-evolve with their microbes, their um, their microbiome as well as pathogens and commensals. I don't think it's going to be uh, completely dependent on the local environment and the life history of an individual. There certainly should be a component of the life history of a species, uh, but I think there there should be some rules that you know a plant in the soup of microbiome that colonizes it ends up uh, converging on approximately the same immune thermostat set point. I think we just don't currently have a great understanding of what that is. Great answer, great question. Um, I think that uh, since we're getting close to 1230, that I will pick one more question and then Raka, maybe you can pick the last question. Um, people have been terrific about uh, staying and listening and engaging. So appreciate that. Um, and this will of course all be on the recording. Okay, I'm going to take the question from Mathilde Christensen who asks, does the dual receptor model include ISR? So do plant growth promoting bacteria need to cause some small damage in order to efficiently elicit ISR. And I'm, I've always been really interested in this whole idea of priming because normally the whole point is that they don't induce defense responses. So, so do you even need damage? I, I doubt anybody's even looked at that. It's a great question. David, do you want to just kind of riff on that one? There, if there is no answer, you just kind of think about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I was thinking a lot about the roots when I was thinking about this, this model. Um, so yeah, I don't I, I feel like this kind of crosses over with uh, Kara's thermostat set point model as well, where, um, yeah, I, mean, I know this is so tough to think about. Yeah, because as normally there would always be microbes present. So I guess there's always some sort of ISR um, from root to shoot. Um, It'd be interesting to look at whether you you know, do that same kind of thing you're doing, you know, plus and minus damage, 
it'll be interesting to see, you know, especially because it still involves those pseudomonas strains that you probably have an enormous library of, right? Um, Let's see if damage alone could induce ISR without. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that, whether damage makes them, that's an interesting question. What is the piece that induces ISR? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's looked at damage. And as far as I know, ISR is usually looked at with maps. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. Maybe with the combination would be interesting. Okay, I'm gonna stop my question there, Raka. Okay, I'm going to ask the last question on the list, which was the most recently submitted um, from Fredrickson and Tilla, uh, so, who asks, this is again, a, probably an unanswerable question, but worth thinking about. Do we have a clear definition of a healthy plant? For instance, there might be opportunistic pathogens in the natural bi microbiome that might cause deleterious effects under certain specific conditions. So in a sense, you know, we are thinking about like what makes something a pathogen, but I like the idea of thinking about like, well, what makes a plant healthy? Um, yeah, I love to think that plants uh, like animals require their microbiota um, and, and potentially even interactions with pathogens to make them healthy. Um, I think in plant biology, we're way ahead of animals in a lot of ways. Um, but in animals, I think there's a better understanding that, you know, encounters with pathogens over an individual's life are really important for establishing immunity, right? If we grow up in too clean of an environment, then our immune set point is off and we're more likely to have autoimmunity. And so maybe for plants, um, interactions with, you know, uh, opportunistic pathogens or endophytes uh, is really important to establish that baseline. Um, and I also wonder if a component of, um, of, you know, some disease in agriculture could be due to dysbiosis in soils that plants don't actually have the opportunity to interact with, uh, with sort of casual natural pathogens over their life, uh, and then don't actually have that uh, immune point set. Um, and then similarly, you know, there's a lot of agricultural pathogens that we don't really see as pathogens in natural environments. And so uh, like Fusarium as an endophyte is a great example that it's really devastating in agricultural fields, um, but we don't see in natural populations as a pathogen as much as more often found as an endophyte. Um, and so maybe this is that our plants are immunocompromised or maybe it's something about the, the life history experience of individual plants and their microbes. I, can, I, can I add to that too? I, I really like that question because <laughs> I feel like I've been thinking about it, like at least half the question with my own project. Um, but yeah, because I'm dealing with opportunistic pathogen where, yeah, it's opportunistic. So it usually isn't a pathogen. Um, it's a pathogen whenever I, I grew it in artificial conditions. But um, yeah, a healthy plant, I, I think from that perspective, maybe a healthy plant is a plant that can. Um, at least when I'm thinking about the rhizosphere, a plant that can simultaneously promote commensals that can outcompete that pathogen while having enough of defense to to fight off that pathogen, or I guess to hold off the pathogen while the commensals and mutualists take over. Um, so I, I think maybe a healthy plant would have a nice interface between um, its own immune system uh, working together with fighting pathogens and being aided by commensals um, outgrowing that pathogen at the same time. Um, just because I think in the rhizosphere, there's a lot more potential for higher microbial loads. So I don't know how powerful the plant immune response could be if it's trying to kill every pathogen or it's, if it's trying to outkill a pathogen faster than the pathogen can grow uh, without some help from um, some aid from the microbiome to help slow down that growth or at least give some sort of competition against the pathogen. So. Well, really great, uh, great presentation. Thank you, Kara and David, again, for your talk and for your lovely review and for taking all these questions. And, and thanks to the audience for some really terrific um, 
questions and ideas. I think the main thing, um, the reason that we that MPMI Journal decided to do this series was to focus on what we don't know. More generally, seminars talk about what we do know, and that's really nice, but there are these huge areas where we don't know. And I think what Kara and David did was a beautiful job of opening that up and highlighting big swaths of this field that we don't know. And, and I think in response, a lot of these questions are talking about things that we don't look at, we don't ask. And I'm hoping that this will inspire, uh, inspire listeners and readers to go off and try some of these questions, try some of these experiments, right? ISR, damps, rhizobia damps, there's just this huge area. And that's just one little snippet of what we talked about. I'm sorry, we could not get to the other 26 questions that people posted, they all look terrific. Um, lots of, I love the, um, like all the curiosity and, and ideas people were, were generating here. So we're gonna stop. Um, this will be recorded and should be up um, within a few hours probably, unless we have some technical difficulties. This time we are uh, including a live transcript. Uh, and thank you to those of you who volunteered to help us edit it and make uh, our seminars more more accessible to people who have um, difficulty hearing or for whom English is not a first language and that closed caption might be really helpful. So um, if you would like to be involved in that for future seminars, you can email me directly. Okay, thanks everyone. Ashley's just typed in the chat where you can find the recording later, um, but you can always go to the virtual seminar link on the NPMI Journal homepage. Okay, thanks. Hope to see you all for June 1st seminar. Bye.